Dr. Snyder joined Permanente Dental Associates. Since that time, he served, per, he served um, in multiple leadership roles and was elected by Permanente shareholders in 2008 to serve as the dental director and chief executive officer of Permanente Dental Associates. Dr. Snyder remains a strong advocate for evidence-based dental practice, oral health research, and medical dental integration throughout his career. His presentation today is titled Kaiser Permanente Integrated Value-Based Care. Dr. Snyder. Well, good morning, and thank you so much for this opportunity to kind of share our story and what we're doing out in the Pacific Northwest about integrating care. And what I'm going to uh, talk mostly about is uh, what I think are the essential elements to operationalizing integrated care and advancing evidence-based principles. And then I'll have some random opinions uh, of some of the challenges and how we can overcome that uh, in really operationalizing care. And so a little bit about us and who we are. Permanente Dental Associates is a for-profit professional corporation, um, a for-profit professional corporation uh, that has a contractual relationship with Kaiser Foundation Health Plan of the Pacific Northwest, which is a non-profit 501c3. So they provide the K and we provide the P of Kaiser Permanente, which is just a brand name. It's not a legal entity, but that's the arrangement. And we define the roles and responsibilities of the uh, arrangement through a dental service agreement, which is similar to medical services agreements. And it outlines what the roles are of each entity. But most importantly, each year, we enter into a contractual agreement around the financial payment and that creates a global payment for us, a per member per month. And you've seen in other presentations that like arrow going up uh, and to really integrate care, you have to get to that global payment because there's a lot of interesting things you can do with a global payment as a group of dentists. So as we get this pot of money each month, a per member per month payment, then we as the professional group can define what we value as a group, and that in turn determines how we pay each other. So that global payment is one of those essential elements, I believe, in operationalizing integrated care. So the Kaiser system, if you think about it, they're in eight regions across the United States. And there's eight autonomous physician groups that are part of that, that care for more than 12 million members. In the Pacific Northwest, the Permanente Medical Group, Northwest Permanente, has about 600,000 uh, Kaiser members. And the dental program, Permanente Dental Associates, and the KP Dental Program, we have about almost 300,000 now. So I have to update these slides. But the most important part about it, 90% of the patients we see in our practice have both Kaiser Medical and Dental. And that's another essential element, that coverage, that dual coverage of Kaiser Medical and Kaiser Dental offers us a tremendous value, especially as, uh, as I talk about our journey to integration around when you get a common health record system. I believe that we can provide the safest care of anybody in our community because we know our patients. We have access to that information in that shared health record system. And we're the only dental group of, in any of the regions. So of the eight, we are the one autonomous dental group. And so there's my opportunity. And that's what I've been working on for the last 10 years, a decade now, of how do I get access to that uh, 11 and a half million Kaiser members in these other regions. And there's the real opportunity. That's the disruptive change that we have before us uh, and the opportunity. So we're a multi-specialty group practice, uh, but predominantly general dentists, but we have all the specialties uh, uh, within our group. So we're, um, again, a, an essential part is that 
we can provide the whole continuity of care across our organization. And recently, we brought in uh, Denturist into our uh, model as well. Uh, in fact, this year, but it's a multi-specialty group practice. And so we can internalize and provide that comprehensive care within our system. Uh, another thing I think, um, and I think this is overlooked, uh, and I think Mike Plunkett will talk a little bit about this, is the role of clinician leadership in driving change and adop uh, in adopting innovation really requires strong clinical clinician leadership. And so we have an ownership model that you start out as an associate and then based on your performance over a three year period, uh, generally about three year period of time, you uh, stand for election to become an owner in the practice and a shareholder of permanent e dental. And that ownership model, there's a big difference between owners and renters. And so we have a committed group of dentists um, due to one of the factors is that you participate in the, the benefits and the results of our performance each year as a shareholder. Disproportionate, everybody in the group receives recognition if we perform really well. It's just disproportionately weighted to the shareholders who's made a financial investment in the organization by buying in to the organization. And I think that's a critical element and it gets me what I want. <clears throat> There's one thing that is non-negotiable in our group and that's quality of care. And I cannot get quality outcomes if I'm churning and burning dentist in the group. So the ownership model really has a retention factor associated with that. And if you look at the, uh, our average tenure in our group, it's nine years. If you make it through the first year, uh, it goes up to 11 years. The biggest reason dentists are leaving Permanente Dental Associates right now, and it's about 5% each year, is retirement. They're retiring from their professional practice. And I think that says a lot about our group the value that dentists see in a group practice model, a multi-specialty group practice model, uh, that's based on a common philosophy of care, and that's permanent e dentistry. That's our model of care, ethical, evidence-based, integrated with a relentless pursuit of quality and patient safety. And I talked about the patient safety already. The integrated health record system, we have so much access to information uh, on our patients from their problem lists, their medications list, their allergies list. We have that all right there. And we make big investments in our quality assurance through our peer review committee structure and an overarching quality assurance program that we, we make big investments to assure that we're doing the right care. And that's where the ethical part is. It's just, we know that if we do the right things for our patients, including um, creating a really uh, uh, compelling care experience, um, we're gonna win. If you do the right thing, fame and fortune will come to us. It's really about doing the right care for our patients, using evidence-based principles we have developed as a group, getting the best peer-reviewed peer literature, and then developing guidelines that help define the care we would expect based on the risk stratification of our patients. So we do a risk stratification and then we have evidence-based guidelines. And you saw that differential in one of the slides where you see not much difference between the services between a low risk and a moderate risk, and maybe more services for the, uh, the high risk patients. That's what we're really driving with our stratification risk assessment tools. And we're building capabilities within our electronic health record system that really help guide that care model. But we invest in that quality assurance and looking back on what is the care we are providing and do we see differences between our low risk populations and our high risk populations. That's what I'm, when I talk about evidence-based dentistry and what I'm really excited about is the, the other component of permanent e dentistry, which is integrating care. How do, what is our role, what is our role as oral health professionals in this larger context of wellness and total health? And that's what we're, we're really defining within permanent e, is what is that role? 
because I really think, and this is my random opinion, I really think we're one of the last specialties in healthcare, and I say that deliberately, last specialty in healthcare, I don't say medicine, in healthcare, that has an hour long visit with our patient. Primary care physicians get about 11 minutes, 11 to 13 minutes. And so what are we gonna do in that hour long visit where we get you, we, we have you captive in that setting. What are we gonna do in that hour long visit uh, as it relates to your total health and wellness? And the journey we're really on is, is moving from you know, sharing information to really taking a shared responsibility for the total health and wellness. Because if you fundamentally believe that the smile is part of your health and wellness, then we have a role in total health and wellness. And now we're defining that and testing different models. So what I think makes us really unique is that we're this vertical integration. We're in, we, we provide insurance, we're the insurer, but that we're also the care delivery model. So as a group, then we can influence, we can influence uh, plan designs that really allow us to practice evidence-based dentistry. So we do things like um, preventative services not going against your annual maximums. That you don't have barriers to getting sealants. We can put sealants on, on as many times we need to each year. So as a professional group, we get to influence the uh, plan design uh, plan designs so that we can really practice that ethical evidence-based care. And we're and the holy grail of all this is then how are we going to get paid for integrating care? And, uh, and the value and, uh, that we provide uh, to those patients uh, during that touch point. This, and dentist, the dental visit is simply another touch point in the healthcare system. And how do we maximize the value of that touch point? So we, um, we have 21 offices um, uh, right in the, if you have ever been to Oregon and Southwest Washington, which is our, really where our service area is, there's the Willamette Valley. It's uh, stuck between the Coastal Range and the Cascade Mountain Range. And that's where 70% uh, of Oregonians live, is right in the Willamette Valley. So our offices, the 21 offices we have are concentrated in that, those population centers in Oregon. And we're, we're really looking at our facilities in different ways uh, than we have at any other time in our group's history. And so the different models we have is we have dental uh, capabilities or uh, uh, clinics within medical centers. So they're right in the medical centers. And there's, uh, and you'll uh, obviously uh, see, oh, that adjacency, you probably have some advantages with that adjacency in those medical centers. But we also have, uh, you know, separate uh, standalone offices, but they're kind of right like next to each other. So there's the, med the medical office, the parking lot, and then the dental office. And so we have those kind of uh, facility model designs. And then we have standalone offices as well. And a lot of that, and why there's more of those, is that we really determine uh, our coverage within services areas based on a 15 minute drive time. So uh, the membership, we want to have offices within 15 minutes that they can get to their dental capability. That's why we spread those offices over that service area. Um, but we're really trying some innovative ones. And this is, uh, we're in our, I think our second year now at Fabian, which is a Portland public school, uh, where we're uh, uh, partnering with uh, three different entities. We're partnering with uh, Portland Public School System, um, a, uh, a Concordia University, and, uh, and Kaiser Permanente. And what uh, Concordia does in the three to PhD uh, program at this school, Fabian is in the lowest social economic uh, uh, portion of Portland, and uh, is uh, with, um, with assisted uh, food programs for uh, the majority, 90% of the students that access that school. And what we're doing at this three to PhD, which is the three trimesters of uh, pregnancy through what you aspirationally want to become in your life, is what we're doing is experimenting with this concept. If we can surround those kids and those families with all the social services, uh, that uh, address the social determinants of health 
including access to a medical clinic right in the dental uh, in the school and access to a dental clinic right there in the school. Can we break the cycle of poverty and provide new opportunities for those kids? Uh, and it's going to be a really interesting experiment for us because we do things from expectant moms and doing uh, outreach and educational programs on health and wellness as well as providing those direct services. They have a, uh, a backpack program, so kids get uh, backpacks with food in it for over the weekends, so they have food uh, 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 for their families. They have a food pantry there where uh, families can come in and buy uh, food there. And so it's an interesting model of where is our role in helping drive uh, and, and hopefully uh, break the cycle of poverty for these families. But one of the other fun ones we're trying, and we're kind of doing it the reverse, I think, of everybody else. Um, what we heard a lot in some of the other presentations were bringing hygienists or other oral health professionals into the primary care setting. And what we, uh, our pathway that we've uh, been on is uh, we reverse that. We decided to say, well, how do we provide primary care services in the dental setting? And why did we do that? Well, we figured, well, it seems like people come to their dentist more often than they see their physicians. And if that's an access point into the healthcare system, how, how can we capitalize that by providing those primary care services in the dental setting? So our uh, office, we uh, opened up, I think it's in 2016, uh, our Cedar Hills office, we have an embedded primary care physician in the dental setting. And, and, and that, I'll show you some of the uh, great results we're getting from that and how we're able to kind of take that touch point and maximize the value of all the services that we can provide uh, in that setting. And so Cedar Hills is one of our first with an embedded physician. And, um, and I'll talk about uh, that as part of the journey uh, that we've been on. And so back, uh, if you think back, and it's kind of sad um, how slow the, uh, this is, how slow we've been in doing this. But back in the uh, back in the 80s, we were taking blood pressures, and, and like our patients were like, "Why are you taking your blood pressure? We're at the dental office." That has totally shifted and changed over time. We started doing these passive referrals, um, you know, really just talking with patients, uh, and I'll talk about smoking cessation with that and trying to get them to quit smoking. And then in the early 2000s, we, we got something uh, that has changed our practice and really driven integration, which is uh, a, a patient-friendly printout of every preventative care gap our patients have that their physician has identified based on their health status that they need to follow up on. That care gap report is simply HEDIS measures. So it's influenza, uh, it's vaccinations, it, it's hemoglobin A1C, it's mammograms, it's colorectal screens. And so we had all this information now right in this one sheet of paper and that was the physician's orders that the patient could take and take it over to the medical center and get those services on. And that really changed the dynamic of all of what we could do. And then uh, recently, uh, we uh, transitioned uh, to a fully integrated a health record system with Epic using Wisdom module on that. And I, I, I kind of can say kind of uh, that um, we're through like the implementation phase and, and I feel like we're just like beginning to the optimi optimization phase of this, um, of our implementation, implementation strategy with Epic. But that's been an amazing thing. And then I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing um, now that we've shown all this value uh, through HEDIS measures, uh, what I'm asking of the physicians now in developing oral health care gaps that are identified during their visit. And then a bunch of work on the workforce model. Uh, and that's where I'm talking about we want to get, we want to have primary care services in the dental setting because we're touching people more often. It's, it is quick. 
Um, so this is our blood pressure uh, screening form that we have. And again, it was, uh, if we identified uh, hypertension during the dental visit, this was based on American uh, Health uh, Heart Association guidelines. And this was a form that we could uh, check off what we uh, needed that patient to do if it did not require immediately uh, transport uh, to the uh, ED, uh, ED for blood pressures. And so that was start, uh, starting of our journey of blending evidence-based principles uh, with integrating care. And then we uh, went down this path, pathway of saying, well, wait a minute. You know, I can't teach everybody in the group, and I can't afford to teach everybody, the 160 dentists in our group, to use the five A's of tobacco cessation. Everybody knows the five A's work, but what I could do is I could get everybody to ask if they smoked, I could advise them, hey, you know, that's really bad and it's not good for your gums. And then I could ask them, um, hey, are you thinking about quitting in the next 30 days? And then what we did is if we identified and assessed somebody as willing, as some willingness to quit, we could say, hey, do you want to, we have a little uh, hotline red phone here in the dental office, goes right to a health education coach and they can talk with you about opportunities that can help you quit uh, smoking uh, uh, tobacco products. And that was kind of, a, again, a, a journey of our saying, saying we can't do everything and we can't afford to do everything in our model, but how do I leverage, how can I leverage those experts in the healthcare system because we're completely integrated, how, do I, how can I leverage those to really help our patients? And that's what we did with ask, advise, assess, and it was easy for us and they could get a hold of somebody. And if they didn't want to talk to somebody that day, we would get information about what the best contact times were, and then we would have a, a, a call back by that health education coach to help those patients. And this is the patient support uh, uh, tool. Uh, this is our care gap report. In this one, um, you're looking at, um, this is a diabetic, so they're looking at uh, the three care gaps that are associated with diabetes. Uh, did you get your retinopathy? Did you get your eyes checked? Uh, have you had your hemoglobin A1C and your urinalysis? And so this care gap report, again, like I was saying, was all, is all based on the HEDIS metrics and the performance. And why that's important why that's really important in driving and operationalized integrated care is health systems are getting paid based on their HEDIS metric performance because it influences Medicare uh, five-star rating systems, and we can have a role in helping them be successful in vulnerable populations by helping them uh, and encourage them to close the care gaps. And the, the best thing about uh, oral health care professionals, and especially our hygienist, is we're really, really good at it. Being that extender of primary care, that common message of prevention, we're good at it. We, were, um, we demonstrated that we were um, at better than almost every department. We routinely were the third department uh, beh behind uh, uh, primary care and uh, nurse treatment in getting people to go on and close their care gaps. And I think that's because of our educational training in which we are driven in dentistry that oral health care is, uh, oral health uh, disease is preventable and that we can, uh, we provide that preventive message all the time. So this is a natural extension for us to really talk about total health and wellness. And the care gap report was really a way for us to share information about those 90% of our patients that have both our Kaiser Medical and Kaiser Dental. And it's been, uh, it's profoundly changed things. This is some work that we completed that I'm really, really proud of. Uh, this was on diabetics uh, this year. Uh, we looked back about five years in the medical program, and they were able to get diabetics to close one of those three care gaps, uh, the eye retinopathy, the hemoglobin A1C, or the urinalysis. And they hovered at about uh, the low 50s uh, for about five years, uh, over a five-year period of time. And so we did a concentrated effort around diabetics this last year. And 
And what we found is that if you went to the dental office, you had about a 68% chance um, to uh, get your, one of those uh, care gaps closed. But if you went to your physician, you only had about a 56% chance of getting those care gaps closed. So we're, we're like really good at this, and we uh, exceeded what we had uh, set it as a targeted range of what we wanted to do, and we've gotten up to 62.58. So really amazing uh, work, and demonstrating that we can play a role in helping manage chronic disease. And we're using diabetes because it's such a natural connectivity as it is association with periodontal disease. And so we're really now, you know, on this new journey um, with the integrated health record system. And, and where that comes into play is really back at that diabetic measure. Because what we're able to do now is we know every diabetic that's coming in in the next 90 days, we know what care gap they're missing, uh, we know who they're seeing, and we can go out in the future, fish for those individuals, and then signal to the office and that care team that you got a diabetic coming in uh, please encourage them to go on and get their care gaps. So it's leveraging this electronic uh, health record system in different ways to identify populations of patients and, and when they will be touching the healthcare system so we can prepare, for, uh, prepare to encourage, encourage that uh, preventative message. And so really when you think about all we're doing now is that in the uh, medical home, the dental home, is we're really just adding uh, the toothbrush here. This is all about being part of that integrated team and the electronic health record system really allows and facilitates uh, that truly integrated medical dental home model. And now we have best uh, practice advisories for our uh, blood pressure. Uh, we still have our old sheet that we give to patients, uh, but we can now CC the physician and, um, and uh, all the data and the vitals are all included in the health record system. Uh, but now these things pop up uh, if someone has an elevated uh, blood pressure or pulse and allows us to then to facilitate facilitate that communication back to their primary care physician uh, through this system. And on the after visit summary that you get after your visit uh, that's printed out, then we can have what follow-up care we traditionally used in our little hand uh, record. And the one thing about, um, the one thing about um, the, our transformation in this journey of integration with the, uh, the patient support tool was that at the beginning for our group, and this is you know, a group that has a shared philosophy of care, that wants to do evidence-based care, that want to integrate care. When we first got those care gap reports, people would uh, do all sorts of things. They would fold them up, put little confidential stickers on them, and, and hand them to the patient and say, uh, your physician was, uh, knew you were coming in today and you got some, uh, they wanted you to follow up on some stuff. And we would, we've moved from that, kind of like I'm embarrassed to, to uh, you know, be part of your healthcare team, uh, to taking a shared responsibility for the total health and wellness of our patients. Transformational change in how we look at ourselves as healthcare providers in that, and I say, I, I, I joke about this with the dentist, you know, if you wanna be called doctor, then you better engage in the healthcare system. And that's really uh, what we're doing. We're a unique specialty in healthcare. We give, we give, some, we give something to people that's tremendous, tremendously powerful. We give people smiles. And, and we know, and we've heard it earlier, it has profound implications on your educational attainment, your readiness to learn. If you have poor oral health uh, compared to you have good oral health, we know that, that you, if you don't get good jobs if you have poor oral health against your peers that get good oral health. And, if you, um, and we know from dating sites, 
that the number one must have for both men and women is teeth. So we can graduate you, we can get you good jobs, and we can get you dates. What other, what other profession, what other, that, what other profession in healthcare, what other specialty in healthcare can provide that profound implication to you in your life? That's why, uh, we're, that's why we really are advancing this. Integrated care, and we do truly have a role in total health and, um, and wellness. And so now we're on this journey really around how do we reimagine the, the, the dental home and the dental care team to really translate and say, if we're seeing people more often in the dental setting, can we, can we provide primary care services? And how do we do that? How do we provide primary uh, care services when we have all these constraints around us uh, based on our practice acts for both medicine and the dentistry? And how do we kind of overcome some of that uh, in our system? And when I said that little uh, care gap report was orders, they were physician orders, uh, this is where, this is really uh, where we can uh, do some innovative things because we already have the order. It's already in their system. And so if you go to our, uh, our Cedar Hills office where we got a physician and uh, embedded in the center, a lot of good things are gonna happen. And we compared these to the other office or other co-located offices. So I said those one offices where they have a dental clinic in the health center, right on the, like the second floor. We compared those and we got amazing results around child, influ uh, child uh, flu um, immunizations, HPV vaccination, adult physicals, uh, cervical cancer screenings, because we're maximizing the opportunity we have during that touch point. And what we do, and this is like really um, uh, mean, um, what we do is um, where we're, where, what services we uh, provide at this office and why we wanted to test the physician model at this office, because we have a pediatric uh, dentist there. So we have a kid dentist there. And so that's a high volume of kids coming through. And so what we're doing is basically looking into the record system and seeing if not only the patient not if the patient has a care gap, we're at also looking at uh, the primary uh, 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 care provider for that uh, child and the little rascals that are making fun of their siblings for going back to see the pediatric dentist will grab them and say, come on in, uh, you're gonna get your flu vaccination today. So it's really amazing what we can accomplish uh, when you have shared information and in this case, co-location of services. And now we're testing this model uh, with LPNs. Uh, limited practical nurses, or uh, I think that's right, uh, limited practical nurses at, we have, a, we're t testing that LPN in a standalone dental office. Um, we're testing it in a uh, adjacent office, kind of the co-location, and we're really trying to test this fishing exercise to fish ahead to really identify what is the value that we can, uh, that we can provide to those patients uh, in uh, providing all the services there. And patients are responding to that, and it, I, I was all fired up about it because I was thinking, well, you know, they're really gonna be excited that we're providing all these preventative services and we're making them healthier and well. They didn't really care too much about that. All they cared was like, well, it's really easy. It's really convenient. I can get everything done here, so I'm gonna do it. And when, what we did is, this is a, a, a test that we ran. And so this was after the normal um, kind of flu clinics in the medical center. Um, had kind of, they were done, the, the bolus was done, and so we, after those, uh, you could still go in to your primary care physician and get uh, influenza vaccination, but what we, what we did after that is we said, well, let's have, let's have an LPN in these offices, at, and let's look at individuals that are 65 years or older that did not have an influenza vaccine the previous year. So they're not compliant, and we, were, we uh, looked over a two week period, this one office, and we were able to provide 194 vaccinations during that period of time to a vulnerable kind of population, 65 years of, of age, Medicare, uh, and they hadn't had the services before. So we expanded that uh, this uh, uh, last year, we provided 744 uh, flu vaccinations, 171 of those individuals didn't even have a dental visit. 
they were out in the waiting room just waiting with, uh, for somebody to receive care. And we did an outreach for them to see if they needed the care. And so we, we can do that. And most of the patients really valued the convenience of getting all the services there. And, and since we've done that, we've shown and demonstrated that we're one of the leading departments uh, in the healthcare system. I get to go to the physicians and say, okay, I'm calling my favor in now because I need your help in two populations. And these are now the oral health care gaps that are printed out on that patient-friendly view around their oral health that the physician and their team see. And the two populations, as you might imagine, are diabetics that haven't been in the last 15 months and kids one year or older that haven't been in to see the pediatric dentist. And why, why am I doing that? Because if I see kids when they're three, we lost them. That we're already gonna take a portion of those kids into the ASC, and that drives a lot of cost. And we know all the studies are really compelling uh, if you have coordinated care for diabetics that it reduce healthcare cost. And so we're not gonna, you know, I fundamentally, and I think we all believe that, you know, we're not gonna solve the, um, the healthcare crisis in this country and the affordability of healthcare this doing sickness care. We gotta do something on this around, uh, around preventative, uh, uh, preventative services. Okay, and so the last part I wanna talk about is what we're doing around that global payment. As I said, that was one of the essential elements. How do we lever leverage uh, uh, the, uh, the global payment in creating a value-based compensation model for our dentist? And if you think about it, uh, traditional, you know, you um, send in claims, uh, how many holes you've uh, drilled in people's teeth, and that goes to the insurance company, and then they uh, pay the dentist. What we've done is we've negotiated that global payment, and then as a group of dentists, we get together and we say, what do we value? What do we value? And we're gonna capture all that data, it's gonna to come to us, and that in turn determines what we pay our dentist. So if you look at our compensation structure for permanent dentist, about 70% of their compensation is a base salary. 30% falls into this range of variable or at risk, our metrics-based compensation for the dentist. And Mark talked about that yesterday a little bit, which I found very fascinating. We're kind of that mixed blend of like per member per month and pay for performance. And so what we've done, and you might, um, you might uh, guess what uh, are some of the elements we use in this, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but some of the elements we use in paying the dentist is patient experience, and did we do something to help integrate uh, their care and provide that, pri uh, uh, that uh, leverage that opportunity to really provide pr uh, primary care services and encourage those? And so we use Press Ganey, uh, and one of the questions we ask is, well, what was, the, what was your dental's, uh, dental care team's concern for your overall health? And if your office does really well on this measure, the dentists get paid more. And this is top box scores. If you look at good and very good, so patients saying, no, God, my, my, they're very concerned, or yeah, they're, you know, it's, they were really concerned about my care. We're 95.1% good and very good around care teams uh, uh, concern for your overall health. And the diabetic measure, that was part of the risk that was part of the risk payment for all our dentists uh, this last year in uh, being able to say, if you're good at closing your di uh, diabetic care gaps, uh, you're gonna get paid more. And we have a very complex system of our compensation model, which is probably the worst thing we ever did because now it drives so much uh, uh, administrative cost to figure out all these. And dentists are really good at like finding every little like thing you did wrong in your comp models and why it's wrong. But, and so we invest in a lot of times in making sure that it's right and correct. Uh, but, uh, and we, what we do is we divide up the comp uh, in kind of different ways. It's kind of like a base, a base pay, base pay, and then it's how does your office do? So how, as a group of dentists, do you do in helping diabetics close their care gap? 
And then we have, well, what was your individual contribution in helping your office perform at that level? And that's kind of our comp model that we have. And I think that's really helped us drive evidence-based care because if you're really good at providing fluoride varnish to your high-risk uh, patients, if you're really good at getting sealants on kids' uh, teeth at, uh, on their first and second molars, then you're gonna get paid more in our model. And in summary then, um, when we think about medical dental integration, I just love this, we wanna, we wanna provide an integrated medical and dental experience. Uh, setting a new standard for high quality, convenient, affordable healthcare. That's our vision of what we want to do. And I believe these are the essential elements that are required to really move to uh, an integrated value-based model. You have to have a group of dentists that share a common philosophy of care. Uh, you have to have a shared population, that 90% uh, that, that have medical and dental Co-location of facilities, I was totally wrong on this one. I thought technology would bridge the gap. It really doesn't. There's still a convenience of being able to walk somebody down to nurse treatment and you get better follow-up than we do if we're in a standalone office. Um, yet the shared informatic platform, we don't even know yet the value of that has for our organization. We're just learning that. We're gonna be developing, I'm really excited about this next year because we're developing dashboards uh, that will provide information uh, real time for all our dentists on how they're doing and managing that population of patients that's been paneled to them. I think it's just gonna be amazing on that and a global payment because it takes out all the other complexities that you hear in the struggles around that. We're just a bunch of dentists, shared com a common philosophy, and we say, what do we value and what do we care about? And then let's measure ourselves as it relates to that. So those that are good at it get paid more. Thank you very much. Really appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> Hi, Greg. Hi, John. You did an excellent job as always. Thank uh, you. Thank you for demonstrating the added value of having dental in a larger medical care system. You also pointed out that of the, what is it, seven or eight KP entities? Yeah. The, nationally, KP Northwest is the only one with dental. Yeah. So could you, do you have information about uh, how the, the other autonomous entity, medical entities are behaving differently or are they getting different outcomes? Do they care that there's this dental, great dental component out in Northwest that is doing great stuff and they are not integrated in any way? Well, I, absolutely. I, th I think w what we've done, um, and I w our effectiveness in this uh, it varies, I think, across those different uh, entities. Uh, and I'm saying the different autonomous medical groups. Uh, but we've done a lot to really share the story. You've been involved in that with National Practice-Based Research Network, the Center for Kaiser Health, that we're really building that body of evidence. But if you go to uh, those groups, it's, it really comes down, we got so much going on, and we, we got to solve Medicare. And yeah, it'd be, uh, we agree it's the right thing to do, it's nice to have, but uh, their energies are focused elsewhere. And, and I say this, and this is my, only my opinion, um, is I think I need a generational change in leadership within Kaiser uh, to really make this change. Because uh, until we have that next um, generation of uh, leaders moving in there that have seen the value of this, and are not entrenched into uh, dental school, medical school, dental insurance, medical insurance. It's always been that way. We got all this other things to do. Um, why don't we do that? And then the sad part, in in some way, you know, sad part, you know, follow the money. You know, um, you get f uh, five hundred and fifty dollars per member per month for a medical member, and you get about you know. 10% of that for a dental member. I got a, I got a few million dollars, am I gonna buy, build a dental office or am I gonna uh, build, uh, buy that new uh, MRI? And so that's the challenge you have is that um, it, it's, you know, it's money, it comes down to money. 
on that. Great question, though. Thanks. Um, when you were talking about the value-based compensation, you kept saying dentists. So my question is, if there's other team members like hygienists and, and assistants, and if they're doing a lot of the handoffs and referrals and, and filling the care gaps, how does that get translated to their compensation, or does the dentist get all the compensation? Yeah, a good, uh, really good question. Um, and I should explain a little bit more uh, clearly uh, in uh, how that uh, dental uh, uh, service agreement is arranged. Uh, Kaiser, Kaiser Foundation Health Plan, uh, as is true in all the regions, provides the offices, the nurses, the front desk staff, and in the dental program, they provide the offices, the hygienists, the dental assistants, and the nurse staff. So the, the support staff is employed by Kaiser Permanente, our Kaiser Foundation Health Plan. We're a bunch of dentists. PDA is just the, a professional entity made up of dentists. And so we're building the value-based reimbursement model because we, uh, we have the opportunity to do that. Uh, they have not made that jump in a meaningful way. They do have performance metrics uh, that we agree upon and share, like Prestini <coughs> survey results, you know, care teams uh, concern for overall health, that's built into a, you know, a small element of their compensation on that. But it's really around, for us, it's, uh, is, it's aligning ourselves around those shared performance metrics, uh, but I get to do it in a much more aggressive way uh, than they're able to, because all those, just like the nurses, they're all represented employees, and so there's a negotiation within their uh, labor contracts of those comp models, and that's a big challenge for them in represented uh, in, uh, workforces. John. The Evelyn. Oh, there you are. <laughs> I, I wanted to dig down a little bit in the EPIC system when yeah. you were talking about the integrated record, because uh, it's not one that I know. So is, uh, is what is in there for dental part of their regular software package, or did they add that for Kaiser? Is it a prevalent package on the medical side? Uh, could a solo practitioner, dental practitioner, use it? And does yeah. it include diagnosis codes? Uh, it has the potential for diagnostic, diagnostic codes. Um, Wisdom, which is the module, the dental module, fits on top of the ambulatory platform. So that allows it to be interfaced with pharmacy or the lab services. So that's how it's kind of structured there. You're seeing a lot more of it, the integrated, um, um, integrated uh, care models that include denta, denta, dental uh, moving towards that uh, platform now. So FQHCs, uh, there's a number of dental schools now that are moving towards the EPIC platform, uh, mainly those ones that are affiliated with the university hospital system because they're using it. I think EPIC has like 80% market pre uh, uh, penetration uh, in the US now, so they're a dominant player. But yes, anybody would have uh, the ability to uh, get that. And that's, you know, when we talked about barriers to advancing integrated care, IT kept coming up as one of them. Wisdom is part of that solution, but, um, and this is my opinion, um, man, it's a lot of clicks to get stuff done. We gotta figure out a different way to allow that to flow through. And so this optimization for us is, is really working with Epic to say, how can we make it more efficient and effective for a high volume practice model like we have? We're not a, we're not a teaching university. Uh, you know, we, we have kind of a, we have a business to run and we can't be clicking all the time to do things. So they're gonna get better on it. Uh, I mean, we got the kind of the beta version of all this, uh, and, and it's gonna get better over time on that. The thing that I warn everybody about is, um, is just be really careful, um, really careful if you're, optimi uh, if you're trying to customize it um, uh, outside their build. Um, once you do that, they got you, you're captive. 
Uh, it's going to, uh, every time you upgrade, and upgrades are coming every six months, you're going to have to retest all those interfaces that you created uh, through your customization. Uh, there's a great governance structure that Epic has now that uh, allows users to really work with them. And I think that's the journey we have to be on, is to keep that native capability uh, in Epic. Thanks for the presentation, that was great. Um, I have a question about pairing. Well, yours was better, I think, oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, <laughs> no, um, the, uh, <laughs> uh, the question has to do with, so we've talked a lot about integration across the sort of medical dental and the different professional models. I'm curious in the way that the global budget works, and this is lack of knowledge on my part, if you ha what is the different payer mix that's going into the global budget in terms of like uh, private, plans versus Medicare versus Medicaid? Um, and is that the same in the global budget for the Kaiser, the medical plan versus the folks that you're covering in the dental plan? Okay, so what, what I would say, uh, how that global payment is, uh, it's on a per member per month regardless. Okay. So if you're a Medicaid uh, member coming from our uh, CCO health share in the Tri-County area of Portland, uh, to uh, a Medicare Advantage plan, uh, the professional entity gets the same per member per month. So it's, a sta it's, it's not a different per member per month based on the, the incoming no, payer? Okay. No, no, they would love us to go to that. Y yeah, I'm sure they would. <laughs> but then you develop yeah. all this complexity right. within that. And I don't think we're very good at that. So can you it very simple? Yeah. And again, what that helps us do is then we can actually, uh, we can actually provide permanent dentistry, ethical evidence base, and integrated because we have, it doesn't matter where you're, where you're coming from, we can treat everybody in the same approach that uh, we would treat uh, uh, our commercial lines of business, our right. publicly funded so lines what, of business. So what is your Medicaid share in the dental plan? Uh, it's very small. Yeah. Tiny. So, I mean, I guess the question is, even if the per member per month was the same, if you had, say, a 50% share of Medicaid and 50% private, you might actually still have to do business differently based on disease, disease patterns that are yes. showing up in terms yeah. of um, moving those populations down. Yes. So, yeah. It's a, yeah, I think there's all these complexities around that that are really interesting to think about when you're driving what, what that evidence-based practice actually looks like. It would be really interesting at some point to see you know, we have these silos and we talk all the time about, oh, well, Medicaid, we can't get dentistry because they're a separate marketplace and the dentist won't take them. And as we think about this move towards these integrated things, we really need to think about those payer moves too. Because if we still keep segmenting the Medicaid market into different, even if we do the global budgets, if we segment that disease into a different marketplace and we don't integrate it into the broader marketplace, you're not sharing the, the, the again, those externalities, you're not sharing the rewards from that as you go forward. Right. You really have to have a balance uh, across your lines of business. Uh, and of course, large commercial, the economic engine of dentistry, uh, that's our biggest payer group, yeah. So we're no different than private practice models. Any other questions for John? Going once, do I, oh, you're all right. Did you have a question? Sangeeta, did you have a question? Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank, thank you. you thank you very much. Thank you. So I think, Annalise, if we're going to move into a discussion session. Um, I can't really remember what. The, I, well, I need my glasses and <laughs> to read anything. But I think, David, would you mind? Okay. So I'll, I'll pass the mic to David here. Okay. 